Thanks. Okay. So hello everybody. So today to hand the fifth seminary of Archaeobotany, we have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Jade Delpom Gades. Sorry for if I mispronounce your name. Huh? It's highly possible. Uh, she is an archaeologist, a computational archaeologist, an archaeobotanist, an ethnobiologist, and she's also the associate professor at the Department of Anthropology of the University of California, San Diego. Her research focuses on understanding how climate change has impacted on seed farming practices. For this, she is using computational modeling, archaeobotany, and ethnobiology methods. Her main research focuses on the Tibetan Plateau and has extended to the rest of Asia. Due to the time differences, the presentation is recorded, but Jade is with us, so there, is, there will be room uh, for questions and discussion after the presentation. The presentation so, is entitled A Deep History of Human Adaptation and Changing Climate on the Eastern Tibetan Plateau. So Jade, I leave the floor virtually to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sal. Let you go ahead and press play and, <laughs> and avoid any technical difficulties too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. I hope you, you can see the presentation of Jade. And everybody that uh, wishes can put their subtitles in their computer, in their teams, so they can read along the along the talk. Okay. So tell me if you can see. So thank you very much for and having listen. me. Um, so the Tibet Plateau temperature with a much higher amplitude than lower altitude locations, and temperatures in the Tibet Autonomous Region have soared by 0 0.4 degrees Celsius per decade since 1960. That is roughly twice the global average. The last 100 years, which is shown by this little um, purple um, line over here, are the warmest in 2000 years, as you can see, of recent history on the plateau. And depending on, uh, on what we do about it, things could get much warmer. So you can see See that the RCP 4.5 scenario, which is one where emissions stabilize at half of the levels of the year 2000 by um, 2030, still sees a massive increase um, in temperatures um, across the Tibetan plateau. Um, and it's unlikely that we will even achieve this scenario. The Tibetan Plateau is the world's third pole, and it's a water tower for the whole of Asia, one which feeds some of the world's largest rivers. Glacial melt has doubled since the year, to, the year 2000 and has begun to create issues for the livelihoods of Tibetans. An example is the recent collapse of a glacier in the Aru Range that I'm showing here, which came crashing onto the margins of a lake moving at 60 kilometers per hour and which deposited roughly 100 million cubic meters of ice and rock, killing the livestock of the family um, who, who graze their animals um, in the vicinity. Glacial loss, as I'm showing here, is also creating um, a loss of critical pastoral land, which is being flooded and converted to lakes and resulting I think we lost the volume. We lost. Celsius. And it has also been creating decreases in available uh, animal forage. Okay. Tibetans are faced with other pressures as well, um, as we well know, um, in maintaining their traditional means of subsistence. subsistence. Resettlement campaigns by the Chinese government are making it harder to access territories that they originally used um, for pastoral and other activities. Um, so pressures are um, are uh, Tibetans are feeling pressure um, from many different angles, not just climate, but also political. So today in my talk, I'm going to be looking at what the deep time record tells us about the long term adaptations that Tibetans have made to their local environment and to changing climatic conditions. And I'll be answering in this talk how sub Tibetan subsistence regimes as they know as we know them today um, first emerged and how both climate and local ecology came to shape these. So archaeologists have been getting a really good idea of what kinds of plants and animals um, have been moved around um, throughout um, prehistory by people, where they've been moved to and when. Um, however, when considering the role that 
ancient climate, may, climate change may have played in these processes. This is often something that's been do done in a very co correlative fashion. Um, so archaeologists, you know, have liked um, to um, relate changes in things like human population density to measures of monsoonal intensity derived um, from paleoclimate records, um, sort of juxtaposing the two um, in a graph um, like you see in this publication here. However, what these studies do not illustrate is the mechanism of climate's influence. How exactly did changes in temperature and pre precipitation impact people or the resilience of the crops um, and animals um, that people grew um, or exploited? So in order to outline these challenges um, and the types of constraints that people must have faced, it's clear that we get a good understanding of what constraints were placed on food producers both by the environment and by the biology of the crops and animals um, that people um, employed um, themselves. And so it's by modeling these constraints that I argue that we can create better models for human behavior in the past. So we know that plants require a wide range of variables in order to complete their life cycle. And today I'm going to focus on models that look at the role um, that was played by temperature um, in limiting the spread um, and uptake of crops to the Tibetan plateau. So temperature is a critical variable um, for limiting plant growth in areas of high latitude and high altitude. So the models that I'll describe in this talk um, model um, model um, where crops were able to go um, using the thermal using their thermal niche. Um, so uh, archaeologists have previously frequently used measures like um, the start and end of the frost free season. However, to model the thermal niche of crops, I used a formula that's known as growing degree days, um, which is one that's commonly used in agronomy, and which is basically just an accumulated measure of heat required by the crop to complete its life cycle. However, spatially modeling growing degree days across space. Um, was challenging um, for this area of Asia as no interpolated um, weather product or GCM um, existed for the Tibetan plateau. So we had to create our own um, and did so by co-crigging, co um, well did so by you know deriving um, temperature data um, from uh, weather stations um, located throughout the GHCN network um, and then we co-crigged to interpolate the distribution of growing degree days across space. Um, now this was great um, for um, being able to tell us how um, what growing degree days look like on the present day on the Tibet Plateau. However, this did not really help us um, as we were trying to um, approach these issues um, in the deep um, human past. So in early iterations of our work, we approached this issue in not the most satisfactory way, and we did so um, by simply modulating temperatures by increasing or decreasing degrees Celsius, according to what local records of climate change indicated about ancient climate, but this wasn't really satisfactory for several reasons. So the first is that it was unable to tie changes in temperature down to specific moments in time, um, but it also assumed that all areas of the landscape responded um, to climate change in a homogenous fashion, and we know that that is not the case. Um, so how could we model what temperatures were like in the past? So while there are a wealth of paleoclimate records for Tibet um, or for the Tibetan plateau, um, many of these could not be readily translatable into temperature and um, precipitation. So those that can are often available only for the very late Holocene or historic period or last 2000 years. So for the early Holocene, most of our sources came from proxies like sea surface temperature, um, which were located at a great distance from our study zone. So in the study I present here, how we approach this issue um, was we used a variety of different compilations of predicted temperature for the Holocene, like this one that was published in 2013 in Science by Shaco and Marcot. But more recently, um, we have updated our methods um, to um, employ um, the data um, from this excellent compilation um, of Holocene um, temperatures that is based, as you can see, on a wide range of different proxy records that was published this year um, in uh, Nature in 2020 um, by Kaufman et al. Um, so how did we model this spatially and temporally? So large regions with rugged topography like the Tibetan plateau respond heterogeneously to climate change with most locations on the plateau um, actually experiencing higher amplitude changes than global or hemispheric averages. So we accounted for the sp spatial heterogeneity by modulating mean weather station climatology, that's the blue lines that I'm showing over here, by shifts in daily standard scores um, that are derived from this global 
record of climate change that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, so you can see um, that um, I'm comparing here a high altitude station, Xining, to, um, which is located 2,000 um, meters above sea level, um, to Chengdu. And you can see that there is greater variability between minimum and maximum temperatures at this high altitude station than at the low altitude station. So basically doing this allowed us to employ the observations from a global record while preserving the greater variability in te daily temperature exhibited by weather stations at higher altitude. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned before, we then employed Krigging um, between weather stations to spatially interpolate temperature. So today I'm going to focus on what these models can tell us about how farming was adapted to a region um, known as the Eastern Tibetan Plateau. Um, that's what I'm showing over here. The former Tibetan provinces um, of Kham um, here and Amdor, um, which I'm going to be calling the Southeastern and Northeastern, um, the SCTP and NETP um, respectively. But first, um, because many of you may be unfamiliar with the archaeology of the region, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the archaeology of the region and what we know about the spread of farming there. And I'll briefly discuss some of the material cultural record and then tell you about what our recent modeling um, as well as um, my uh, archaeobotanical and zoo archaeological work in the region has brought to light. So when thinking about how early farming spread onto the Tibetan Plateau, scholars have made a number of different assumptions that are largely consistent with a wave of advanced model for farmer expansion. So according to these models, a culture that's known as MyJL, um, whose farmers practice broomcorn and foxtail millet farming and pig husbandry, um, spread onto the northeastern margins of the Tibetan Plateau by about 6,000 to 7,000 years ago, um, and then moved onto the plateau proper by about 5,500 BP, carrying their crops and animals with them and also carrying this very characteristic painted um, type of pottery. So archaeologists who've highlighted the Magyar spread have made a number of assumptions about the manner in which farming was moved onto the plateau. So the first is that um, they have assumed that um, once Magyar farmers moved farming onto the plateau, um, they practiced farming everywhere across the surface of the plateau. Sometimes um, some people have argued, as in this paper here, up to altitudes of even 4,400 meters above sea level. So because of this, when archaeologists have unearthed um, seeds or um, the remains of ancient plants on archaeological sites, there's been this tendency to assume that this represents evidence of in situ agriculture, people who cultivated that crop um, in place or locally grown. And this assumption has really led archaeologists on the plateau to neglect the potential rule that may have been played by other groups, I'll argue, like foragers in aiding or abetting the spread of agricultural products across this area. And so by extension, you know, foragers um, are seen as having made very little linguistic or genetic contribution to modern Tibetans um, and um, are, you know, portrayed as um, largely um, passive actors. Um, and so spreading farmers would have been responsible for these um, linguistic and genetic patterns on the plateau. So data from one um, low elevation site, um, Yunkanshan, located at 1,700 meters above sea level on the margins of the southeastern plateau, Tibetan Plateau here, may seem to conform some, to, to some of these exploitations for this wave um, of migration, a wave of advanced migration model. So data from Yunkanshan shows that the inhabitants of these sites lived in these permanent wattle and daub houses that are very similar, that are identical in, in construction to those that are employed in the Majail core area in northern China. Um, another similarity that they share with these houses are burials, um, are the, is the presence of burials in the foundations, um, indicating that these people maintained a very strong connection to place. So their pottery assemblages, as I'm showing here, um, are, you know, really dead ringers um, for um, material from the Majao cultural area. So you can see um, that this is the case not only for these high-fired um, uh, prestige wear um, and painted prestige wear, um, but also for daily wear. Um, so really, we see an import of this entire um, pottery repertoire into the region. However, this wasn't the case everywhere. So now if we move, um, we shift focuses and move to the northeastern Tibetan plateau, to the former province of Amdor, um, there's data from um, the Zulmuru site that's located at a higher altitude that shows a very different um, 
pattern of interaction between foragers and farmers. So the first type of evidence that we have for forager farmer um, interaction at the Zomara site comes from burial data. So there are two main types of burials at the site. So first we have um, extended prone burials, which are the majority of burials of the site. And this is a style of burial that is not present in the core, Majayal core area. People in these burials um, are buried with this distinctive tradition of hand built um, painted pottery. And while this pottery sort of imitates some of the general principles of design of Majayal pottery, um, it's actually quite different. You know, painted designs um, cover um, the surface of the pot in a much more sparse fashion. The configuration um, and content of the designs is different. Um, they are also um, hand built um, and they are not um, high fired or manufactured on a wheel like some of the Majayal um, uh, comparative um, pieces. So the other type of burial um, is one that's similar to those from the Majayal core region, and these are extended supine burials, which form the minority of burials at the site. In these burials, we find this wheel turned, burnished, and high fired um, pottery that is 100% consistent um, with Majayal assemblages. However, what's really interesting about the pottery in these burial, bur uh, burials is that only small pieces of pottery that could have been transported by hand um, are found um, in the burials themselves. So chemical analysis that was carried out by Hungerol um, also suggests that these were manufactured in the Majayal core region um, and then carried to the Gongha Basin. Um, so it's possible that these um, two very different modes of burial may represent two different identity groups, um, local foragers who practice their own um, type of unique type of burial and pottery production um, and a migrating minority of pioneering farmers. So moving back onto the SCTP but into an area of lower altitude, Altitude, the Cairo site contains another example of potentially complex interactions between foragers and farmers. And archaeologists working in the region um, have previously argued that Cairo was the result of migrating farmers um, from the Majayal core onto the Tibetan plateau. However, a closer look at just some of the material culture or some of the key material culture, like their pottery, really casts doubt on this assumption. So the pottery at Cairo is highly distinct. Um, vessels are not painted, they're rather decorated using um, in, uh, incised delight. Lines, and then they also have a completely different repertoire of shapes. The second thing that's worth noting about the site is um, different types of housing um, that are reconstructed. So in the earliest phases of um, Karo's um, occupation, um, we do not see um, the wattle and daub houses that are known from the Majayal core area that tend to be square um, in shape. Rather, we see um, much smaller, um, rounder, um, more ephemeral occupations that may actually um, correspond to uh, tents. Um, in terms of tools at all of these sites, the types of tools that people employed seems to be largely consistent with hiding, sorry, with hunting and hide prep. So large, we see large numbers of microliths and bone technology that's aimed at hunting and processing hide. Sickles are interestingly present at some sites at Kavro, but not at others like um, Zongru. So what should we, um, and then, you know, we also have things like uh, fishing uh, weights. So what should we make of these patterns? So what does some of the zooarchaeological and archaeobotanical evidence show us about the movement of domesticates onto the plateau? Did people actually move, um, you know, plant and animal domesticates onto the plateau? And how can this help us elucidate what was happening? So the zooarchaeological record at these higher altitude sites, so Xiaowenda is, ad is adjacent to Kaoru. Here we have data from the site of Zongru and then Hashio, which is um, uh, uh, which is another high altitude site, shows that um, people were pretty much um, reliant on large to medium um, mammal hunting um, and fishing. The only domesticate present um, is the dog. Um, these are a series of sites. Um, Dayato, uh, uh, Daoli Jiaping, and Shishan are sites from the Majayal core area. And there you can see that um, there are uh, higher proportions of pig. Interestingly, that first site that I mentioned, Yingkanshan, also has um, higher proportion um, of, uh, of pigs. Um, so this shows that um, at least animals that had to be foddered um, or closely um, guarded by humans, um, aside from dogs, you know, that are much older domestic and used for hunting, are simply not um, uptaken on the on this er in this area of the Tibetan plateau. Um, however, the archaeobotany shows a pretty different picture to the zoo archaeological evidence, and both millets, um, foxtail and broomcorn millet, alongside kinopodium, um, which there is increasing evidence was actually consumed and potentially cultivated in the Majayal area, and I'd be happy to discuss that later, appear on sites on the eastern Tibetan plateau. So you can see um, that they appear um, both at uh, Yimkanshan, low altitude, and high altitude sites like Karul um, and Zongru. So what should we make of this? 
Um, so in our recent work at the Zongru site, which we published in Antiquity, we compared the proportion of agricultural weeds in the assemblage of Zongru to those from other Ma Jiao sites um, of similar date across northern China and found that the assemblage at Zongru was quite unusual. It was one that appeared to be consistent with already cleaned and processed grain being shipped to the site. Um, so we argued that foragers at the site likely exchanged clean grain with farmers in lower elevation for products um, from their higher altitude environment um, that may have been composed of things like hide, salt, um, and even potentially um, wild animal meats. So the fourth millennium BP, however, represents a critical moment of climate change around the world, one that is characterized by cooling temperatures. So here what I am showing is some probability um, densities of radiocarbon dates that I carried out um, across the Tibetan plateau. Blue represents dates that are carried out on millet, gray on wood charcoal, and red on wheat and barley. So one of the interesting things that this pattern revealed is that following 3,500 Cal BP, millets appear to largely fall out of the diet on the margins of the Tibetan plateau and are replaced by two new crops, wheat and barley. There's some sites, um, like those occupied by for what I would argue are foragers at Zongru, that show continuous occupation, however, and that's um, sort of represented by some of these grey um, dates um, over here and some of the continuation um, of millet and both wheat and barley on the northeastern Tibetan plateau. Um, but others like Ying Kan Shan um, on the southeastern Tibetan plateau are completely um, abandoned. So why did this major transition in subsistence regimes take place? So I decided to take a look at where millets could or could not have been grown across the Tibetan plateau. So because these crops have been relatively poorly studied, there's been a bit of confusion in the archaeological literature about them. So um, initially, um, a couple of groups um, thought that they had um, that because these crops had gr a short growing season, they were actually well adapted to high altitude conditions. However, this is not the case. Despite their extremely short growing season, they both um, require um, very high um, minimum germination temperatures. They have no crop tolerance and um, by extension they require um, higher numbers of growing um, degree days um, so are in fact quite maladapted to areas of high altitude. So here are our results from our niche model of where millets could be cultivated. So you can see um, that prior to 3,500 um, BP, um, Ying Kan Shan and Zongru are well within the niche. Karo lies um, in a deeply incised valley on the margins of millet cultivation. So people could have grown millets at these sites on the plateau. However, we argue that the archaeobotanical evidence shows that foragers didn't always uptake these crops and rather in some instances chose to continue their traditional lifestyle and and rather engage in much more complex patterns of trade with farmers. However, all of these sites, as you can see, following um, really 3,700 BP, growing millet becomes um, problematic. Um, and the probability of it, of it being in the niche, um, so, um, you know, you can see here is starting to decline to around 80%. So, you know, out of 10 years, that means um, that uh, two two out of those 10 years, you would have crop failure. And while this might not seem particularly high, if you're a farmer using, losing an entire two years of your crop, certainly maybe. Um, this, can, this pattern continues um, after, um, you know, 3000 BP, and you can see that millets um, nearly uh, almost completely fall out of the niche um, in these uh, high altitude river valleys um, and plateaus across the Tibetan plateau. So niche modeling has really showed us just why Tibetans stopped growing millet. There simply were not sufficient temperatures um, to continue to do so. So. so in the centuries following the fourth millennium BP, a number of new transformations took place on the margins of the eastern Tibetan plateau and in completely new cultural facies appears. Um, we see the abandonment of Majayal sites altogether, um, but new cultural facies start to appear that start, um, that, that show an increasing well, sorry, connection to the northern steppe. So we start seeing stone lined cis tombs as well as bronze knives that are sometimes traded in um, or imitated from um, pieces that are um, produced in both the Ordos and Mongolia. Um, and we also start seeing things like an increase in secondary burials, like what I'm showing here, suggesting that people may have been more mobile um, and people may have died in different locations and then had to, be, to, be, to um, return um, their dead to um, the, the main cemetery um, after a certain period of time. As I mentioned before, two new crops, wheat and barley, also move um, into East Asia during this period of time. 
Um, so these crops, crops show a variety of new traits um, like frost tolerance um, and th the ability to be grown with much lower numbers of growing degree days than both millets, a facet that has aided their adaptiveness to the environment um, of the plateau. So if we compare um, their niche, you can see that wheat and barley are clearly capable of occupying a much wider niche than both millets, um, and they were resilient um, throughout this major episode of climate change. Their frost resistance and tolerance of cold temperatures allow them to occupy parts of the plateau well after millet cultivation was no longer possible. However, this modeling also reveals other key aspects of subsistence on the plateau. So regardless of the period during which agriculture was practiced, it was largely tightly confined to these lower altitude uh, valleys um, and not the higher altitude parts of the plateau. So this is important because during this later period of time as well, archaeological sites that, have, that contain wheat and barley have been found at higher elevations than the predicted crop niche. But traditionally, these have always been interpreted as being occupied by people who were farmers. I argue that crop niche modeling shows us that this wasn't necessarily the case. And following the second millennium BC, people began to move grains into altitudes well above where these crops could be cultivated. So looking at this data another way, another way, you can see that following 4000 BP at sites on the Tibetan plateau, we start seeing crops appearing at sites um, that are located well outside of their probability of being the niche. So here you can see in these initial phases of of um, of occupation, uh, crops are really located, um, you know, are found in areas where they could have been cultivated. But then following 4000 BP, um, we start seeing crops appearing all the way across the spectrum. And this, in fact, intensifies throughout the historic period, um, well outside of areas where they could have been cultivated. So what this may point to is increasing networks of exchange between farmers and people who relied on other forms of subsistence, namely Castralism. So this is indeed because wheat and barley were not the only new products to arrive in, the, on, in Tibet during this period of time. They were accompanied by pastoral animals like cattle, sheep, and goat. Um, pastoral animals that, along with the eventually domesticated yak, allowed humans to easily move calories into areas far beyond those that are agriculturally productive um, and that once may have been the exclusive preserve of hunters. So pastoralists that exploited these animals could trade with farmers and carry grain into elevations well um, beyond um, where crops were cultivated. And we know that this is the case ethnographically. So today, Tibetans distinguish between three main forms of subsistence. We have farmers that are called Shingpa or Rongpa, um, nomadic pastoralists that are called Brokpa, um, and then we have people um, who practice the Samadrok or vertical transhumans. So here what I'm representing is a valley um, that I've worked at on the southeastern Tibetan plateau in the upper Dadu River Valley. And you can see that people carry out crop cultivation up to altitudes of 3,200 mazel um, meters above sea level on terraces in these um, narrow river valleys that cross cut this area. However, in altitudes higher than this, this is where animals are taken to access forage grass. This system allows Tibetans, sometimes even Tibetans within a given family unit, to access a wide range of different, of different ecotopes and access both the products of farming and pastoralism. So in conclusion, following the end of the climatic optimum at about 4,000 uh, 4, years ago, both wheat and barley became necessary for farming to become implanted in parts of the plateau because of their frost tolerance and lower growing degree day, day requirements. And it's really this critical moment of climatic change that explains why um, we had this major transition in subsistence on the Tibetan plateau and why millets fell out of the diet. Pastoral animals also played a critical role in allowing Tibetans to exploit these higher altitude ecotopes that were once the unique preserve of hunters. So modeling, um, in particular crop niche modeling, I argue, can help us um, can help us uh, understand where the limits of agricultural production lay in the past and allow us to account for this great range of diversity and economic adaptations across the plateau that range for people who are more intensively engaged in farming in lower altitude val uh, valleys, all the way through um, yeah, through full, through to full nomadic pastoralism in higher altitudes. Throughout Tibetan prehistory um, and history, I argue, subsistence is really focused on interactions between foragers, farmers, and pastoralists that resulted in trade for items like salt, hide, and fur in exchange um, for grain. So Tibetans have really created this unique economic system that has allowed them to access these multiple climes, multiple climes of this highly orographic landscape, an adaptation to their natural environment that has really proved resilience since the resilient since the time when it first emerged, or for the past four millennia. These adaptations are, however, at risk by global warming, which I have 
I've shown you that is taking place on a scale that may dwarf anything that happened during the early Holocene and may result in substantial shifts um, in where plant species can be cultivated and where animals can be foraged. In addition, Tibetans lifestyles are also being threatened um, by campaigns aimed at resettlement, which are cutting pastoralists off from critical territories that they need to drive their animals to pasture. So this is unfortunate because this is taking place at the same time as when across Asia, knowledge and biodiversity of other potential grain crops, ones that I've shown are ironically the best adapted to our global climate, uh, to our global warming scenario or hot and arid conditions like millets are being lost at an alarming rate in order to push commodity crops like wheat, rice and maize. So you can see here how much the area in which foxtail millet has been cultivated has declined over the past 40 years in the People's Republic of China and billions of research dollars are being fueled into, you know, researching how to make wheat, rice and corn more drought tolerant. But each of these crops naturally requires high amounts of water and do not actually um, necessarily have um, some of the same heat tolerance that some of these millets do. Um, so by not hedging our bets um, beyond the big four, we may be losing out on, on some of the knowledge that has served um, humans for millennia of sustainable farming and in particular has helped humans um, through um, periods of time that are um, warmer than some of our recent past. So in my lab, um, just to give you a little highlight of some of the work that we're doing, we're researching the agronomic properties of these crops um, and identifying traits that may be useful um, to uh, modern farming systems. As an example of this paper um, that we um, recently reviewed here, um, we were looking at the role that proso millet um, may um, play in its potential for cultivation in the Pacific Northwest United States. So we're integrating the data from this project, not just to create backwards looking models of how humans did react to climate change in the past, but we're also running forward looking scenarios to see how these dynamics um, may play, play out um, in the future. Um, and this has been work that I have um, largely um, carried out um, with thanks to um, my, uh, my postdoctoral fellow who went through my lab as a graduate student, um, Cedric uh, Javier Remy, um, who's native to Rwanda and who's also researching African millets. So around the world, I'd argue traditional farmers have faced change, challenge, changing climatic conditions. They've done so over the course of millennia and they've developed agricultural and social social systems that have been resilient, not just over a few years or over the course of um, what we're capable of carrying out in terms of field trials, but rather over over thousands. And it really behooves us to learn um, and to pay attention to some of this traditional knowledge, particularly um, in our global climate warming scenario. Um, so thank you. That's all I have. And I'd be happy to take um, any questions. Thanks. It's always weird listening to oneself giving a pre-recorded talk. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Um, Thank you very much. Huh? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. And now I think uh, we will have some questions. Uh, I don't know who wants to, to start. I have a quick, uh, uh, certainly uh, a very quick question. It's more about uh, nowadays. Uh, what's going on for the pastoralist people? Because you were speaking of uh, resettlement and, uh, and all the global warming issues. Uh, how they are surviving? Is there any hope with the Chinese government to improve the situation or are we in a blind Yeah, so, um, so there, there are several um, uh, government programs that are going on in China um, right now. And, you know, these are similar to what's been going on pretty much, I'd say, in conservation programs around the world, right? So um, there's this vision that, you know, humans are sort of somewhat parasitic on the environment and they're not part of natural systems. So there's this um, sort of blaming of, or has been, you know, historically, well, I mean, one that is increasingly critiqued within China too, you know, this blaming of pastoralists for increasing processes like erosion and stuff. So there are two programs in China. One is the Tuigong Fanling, which is returning the farmland to forests program where people are trying to reforest farmland areas, but also, um, you know, pastoral fields um, in, in those sort of lower altitude locations that can actually support forests. And then in, in, in higher altitude, there's the sort of, um, there's the, 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 the Tuimu Huanshao, which is basically um, converting pastures to grasslands project, um, which is ongoing. Um, and so what this is essentially, what's essentially happening in those higher altitude regions is um, 
pastoralists who are traditionally um, nomadic pastoralists are being forced into a, a ranching type of model. They want them to um, keep the cattle in enclosures on ranch, on like a ranch type of farm, fodder them with food and not um, have them employ these longer distance patterns of mobility that were critical. That of course mm -hmm. by necessity also involves mm -hmm. the resettlement of the pastoralists themselves um, into village. So, you know, as you can imagine, this is a point of considerable um, government, you know, resistance from Tibetans um, and a source of huge conflicts, but one that I think is, you know, quite damaging actually to the pastoral landscape itself because the types of yep. biomes are maintained through animal grazing but then also when you have a whole lot of animals all put together in one very limited territory now that's really where you actually get more erosional driven processes and landscape degradation happening so it's yeah, sort of actually disconnected yeah mm. yeah that's the opposite of mm. what we'd hope to see but that's what's been going on but you know i want to say it's probably similar to you know what's going on in the middle east with pastoralists i think that this is generally a, a problem that people around the world mm. have with with pastoralists but it's, it's it's pretty much the exact same processes that are happening in in china um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah. Sorry to start with a sad question, but uh, yes, uh, it was my curiosity to know if there was an improvement or not. And um, yeah, like I think there's some, you know, there's some movement away from it. Um, but, you know, but yeah, <laughs> I think it's still it's still somewhat somewhat ongoing. And then, you know, this is exacerbated. This might be exacerbated in the future by the, their plans to build one of the world's largest national parks on the eastern parts of the Tibetan Plateau that are really, you know, territory where both Tibetans and speakers of other non-Tibetic but related languages, um, like Yalrongic languages, live and it will probably result in, you know, quite a lot of resettlement and negotiation yeah. of these processes. Um, so, yeah, it's unfortunate, but <laughs> it's definitely ongoing. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, and I could elaborate on that a bit more. Like, I actually work in one of the national parks in China, the Jiujai Go National Park, and there, the people are, um, you know, they practice vertical transhumance and farming, and they're they're not really able to farm any longer, and um, you know, aren't you know, they still like, you know, their animals are still, they're still allowed to take their animals out to pasture, but there's this reforestation movement that's happening. And yet we have archaeological evidence that people yep. carried out farming on those terraces for like 3,000 years. <laughs> um, but the, the view is, is that it's the impact on the landscape is recent. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, I see Etela have a, a, a question, so I don't want to hold on too much. <laughs> Thank you, Celine. Thank you for the, for the talk. It was really interesting. I have a question about the evidence in this treeless environment. What's the evidence on those contexts on uh, firewood or fuel used? So um, yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, there, um, there, there, so there are several types of biomes. So a lot of the places I work are actually quite heavily forested. So, you know, we've got like a lot of the burning um, is really taking place through, you know, tree cutting or, you know, you know, small scraggly shrub bush um, burning and stuff. But indeed, once you, th there has not been a whole lot of archaeobotany done on the higher altitude sites of the Tibetan Plateau. But I do expect that once people start targeting those sites, we're really going to see, you know, patterns where people are using more dung for fuel um, and things like that. Animal dung, um, yeah, like animal dung is so critical, like the yak dung is just so critical to subsistence systems on the Tibetan plateau. It's used from everything like building houses to, you know, making fires. And, um, and I'm sure that we should expect to see more of this in the archaeobotanical record. Okay. And uh, another question yeah. about the horses. Why the evidence is so low? And if um, it's increasing there's actually, Yeah, there's actually a fair amount of evidence um, for horses. Part of the issue is that, um, so there, there's quite a bit of evidence for horses. And when they're found, they're primarily found in uh, burial contexts on the Tibetan Plateau. We have horse at the site that I'm excavating, uh, Shanao in the Jiujai Go National Park that dates to about, um, I want to say it's in layers that date to the Han Dynasty. So that's about 200. BC ish. Um, but there's earlier finds of horses on the Tibetan Plateau as well, for instance, in burials around the Lhasa area, but also throughout the eastern Tibetan Plateau. Um, 
And the only issue with those burials is that they've just really been poorly dated. A lot of them were excavated during the 1980s before people in the region were applying systematic radiocarbon dating. So they're dated by association. Um, but unfortunately, people haven't carried out direct radiocarbon dates on them. And that's something really necessary that needs to happen so we can get a better understanding of, you know, when exactly the horse is introduced um, to and, this area. And yeah. No dogs. No dogs. Dogs, yes, dogs are present. Okay. Dogs Thank are you absolutely very, thank present. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. yeah. <laughs> And, and in fact, actually, on the higher altitude sites on the Tibetan Plateau, um, like Zongru and Karo, those two sites I mentioned, the only domesticate is the dog that you have on those Neolithic sites. That's the only um, domesticated animal that's been found in the, in the earlier Neolithic. Marina wants to say something. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Marianne, Celine, and of course, Gabe. Uh, well, I, I'm not. I don't belong to this discipline of archaeobotany, etc. But it's and maybe you have said something in your about this in your talk. But uh, I'm afraid I did. I couldn't take everything because you really speak very fast. So, but really, really. <laughs> anyway, I hope uh, if I repeat myself what you said, tell me. And okay, is only that. Uh, as far as I understand, you have some uh, burials and uh, occupations of uh, uh, hunter-gatherers or foragers, okay, with special types of pottery and uh, etc. and the uh, positions of the body, etc. And they are different from those of farmers, etc. So the question is, have you ever seen in this plateau or in this um, seguimiento, oh my god, this uh, check that you have made along the uh, years, okay, in the in this area, had you ever seen a farmer or um, better a forager that go went into farming and then later went back into foraging or something? Y yeah, similar? yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's so actually, actually, oh, sorry, I'm getting some echo there. Okay, that, can you still hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm just hearing myself talking. I'm not sure why, so it's a little a little distracting, but um, but but basically, I think that that's actually the exact evidence that we do have at Zongra uh, at that one site I showed you with the burials. So what's really interesting there is you get the arrival of these farmer burials. You start seeing millets and stuff showing up, and then they're gone and the whole system of like settlement of the site changes it's a lot more of a it's a lot more of an ephemeral occupation it seems like people go back to actually doing what they were doing earlier on um at Sondra. um and i'd argue that at other sites that's potentially the same the same process as well um but some of those are are a little well a little well less excavated. So you know we we have this gap in occupation that I showed you on those radiocarbon dates that lasts about 500 years. But that doesn't mean that people weren't there. It just means that they're probably occupying the landscape in a bit more of an ephemeral way, like they did previously to um, to you know these large Neolithic um, these larger sort of the, these larger sort of settlements with permanent houses and stuff. Um, so I, I absolutely believe that that is what foragers are doing, and 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 in a way, even when they had this contact with the farmers, it's apparent that they never stopped doing the hunt. You know, they they never stopped hunting. They never um, they never stopped large parts of their lifestyle. So there was really a huge amount of continuity, and maybe the only thing that changes is the degree of permanence and settlement, right? So people settle for longer periods of times in one place. Um, and leave more archaeological signature concentrated in, in one location, but um, the I'd say the subsistence patterns are probably quite similar to what was happening beforehand when they were when they were more mobile. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks, pleasure. <laughs> yeah. I also have a question, Jade. Uh, when I had an, enough time to see one graph you showed. Uh, with the quantities of millet and other plants 
but I saw that uh, while millets were cultivated, you had also a fair amount of canopodium that you uh, put separated from, from the wheat. And yeah. I wanted to ask you, because I couldn't see if the numbers uh, underneath were chronologies or, or altitude, but in any case, I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think it was the role of this canopodium? Yeah, um, so I, I firmly believe that the canopodium was being cultivated, actually. Um, and so that's based on several lines of evidence. So one is that we know it was being cultivated in later periods of time. So they're actually like Han Dynasty tombs that have these jars of food in them. And the jar is labeled millet, but it's full of kinopodium, actually. So, you know, it's a pretty good indication that people were like, yeah, you know, like they, they, they're they considerate, you know, people consider it along the same lines as millet. Um, they're employing and eating it like a type of millet, um, but it's actually, you know, it's actually kinopodium. So there's no evidence though in East Asia for kinopodium domestication in terms of thinning of the testa or um, the pericarp or any, you know, just no, like, I mean, it, you know, this is a plant that's retaining its wild morphology, um, but I, I'm, I, I, I am increasingly sure that it's being cultivated, or even at the very least, it's being gathered um, in a way that's consistent, you know, with, um, with the way that people are, are gathering cultivated plants um, and being replanted, I believe, so, yeah. yeah. And, and we find it in, you, you know, it's it's really like the the primary taxa that we're finding in these sites as well, aside from millets, and that that's true throughout the history of occupation of this area. So I'm pretty sure it played a kind of important role. Okay, but then it changes a long time, or it it changes uh, regarding to altitude because I, I wasn't sure. Um, oh, it seems to be present in both altitudes actually, like all the way up to the high altitude sites. Kinopodium okay. seems to be pretty present. So even um, even like some of the really high altitude stuff I've looked at on the Western Tibetan Plateau, Kinopodium is still there. And I think it's just, you know, probably that the plant is so well adapted to, to you know, it's such an adaptive plant to both, well, wide range of altitude, um, you know, low water conditions. It's, it's quite an adaptable plant. So um, I think it just does pretty well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Celine wanted to ask something else. Oh yes, I have again a, a quick question, yes. uh, yes. which is more about uh, the tool from the one of the cultures you presented. Uh, of, uh, it's the Majao culture, actually. Yeah. Uh, there was some uh, tools and uh, some uh, fishing tools, so I guess that was from the reapers, no? Yeah. Uh, to, to, and I sure. and I was wondering because uh, uh, the waves and uh, uh, really look like some uh, uh, look like some loom weights or some kind yeah. of uh, spinner worm. So do you do you have any insight about the textile productions? They might have yeah. these are very similar. Yeah. So um, we have uh, we do have some loom weights. Um, we have fishing net weights as well. Um, and then in the later Bronze Age burials, but also I think in one or two Neolithic examples, we have like very nice examples of spindle whorls. In fact, spindle Ooh. whorls are one of the most common, um, the, the most common uh, implements that are placed in the Bronze Age burials, actually. Like they're sort of like, you know, they're probably associated with female burials. Um, they're sort of like, you'll get um, either a bronze knife, you know, either a bronze knife, a piece of pottery, and then the other thing is always a spindle whorl um, in, in a certain proportion of the burials. So it's a very um, ubiquitous object. The, the sort of increasing quantity in them, from what I know, really starts around the Bronze Age. But it's really interesting to be thinking about what people are cultivating and what, you know, if they're using plant-based textiles, or are they using this for animal-based hairs? Um, and yeah. that's very interesting. So, you know, yak hair is very important as a resource. Um, and it's got these nice properties in that um, when it rains, the yak hair actually expands and stops the rain from coming in. Um, so mm -hmm. it's very good for making tents and stuff like that. Um, and animal hair is, is still, um, you know, both from yak and, and other ruminant animals is extremely important on the Tibetan plateau today. But at the one site that I'm excavating on the Eastern Tibetan Plateau, and this is the actually the only find that I know of it in East Asia, we have a huge amount of flax at that site. Um, that as far as I know, I have not, I have looked and I have not found flax cultivated anywhere else in East Asia, but it's on the site, it's it, at the site on the margins of the Eastern Tibetan Plateau. It, it's sort of, um, 
found in very large pits and it's all carbonized, which leads me to think that, you know, given the quantity and the fact that so much of it is completely charred, that maybe people are actually using it for oil more than, um, uh, than, more than textiles. For fibers. Yeah, 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 not for fibers. But um, we, we, I mean, we don't have textile evidence at that site preserved. Um, but so, so, it, so the Heidi, if it could be animals or vegetal, it could be both. Uh, there is yeah. no real uh, remains, just the toolkits. Just the toolkits, yeah, and the spindle yeah. whorls, which is which is pretty cool. And and they're 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 yeah. almost exactly similar to the types of spindle whorls that people in the in the region use today. Actually, I mean, you know, if you go to a traditional town where Gael Rongek speakers or Tibetan speakers are making textile, I mean, they're using the exact same type of spindle whorls to oh, um, you know spin their textiles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just exactly, exactly the same. And they're they're generally, I mean, sometimes they're made out of bone. So most often, they're made out of pottery. Um, yeah, and then yeah. lots of needles, lots of lots of bone needles and stuff as well. This is the other thing that we find. That's very and interesting because yeah, I've never yeah. heard of it. I mean, from a, such a yeah. small period, uh, so and uh, it makes yeah. sense to to because the preservation is quite good. I mean, even yeah. it's very amazing. So yeah. It's mm. it's it's really it's it's really cool mm. and it's definitely you know it's it like and textiles are sort of such an important identity marker as well in terms of like the way that they're manufactured on the plateau today and how you know the style and design of them too. So I think it's I mean somebody really needs to do more research on this. It's a very <laughs> cool question. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Everybody put their hand up, so I don't know if there's okay. any question, but I think uh, over with questions. <laughs> we don't have any more. Yeah. No worries. I can tell you about like one other cool find we kind of have in the area is that of Citron oh, yeah. corn. Yeah, um, so citron peppercorn is this plant that's um, used in a lot of citron cooking. It's got, it's, you know, it's uh, the Xanthos Island species that produces this numbing effect in the mouth. And there's actually Xanthos Island in like some of the earliest Neolithic sites in the area, like those Majayal sites. So that's another pretty cool um, <laughs> thing is, you know, some of the spices that are still used in this region today are actually very old and <laughs> people have been using them for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think it's uh, really interesting to reflect on these uh, changes that were climatic, uh, uh, climate driven, but uh, how people adapted and how they choose yeah. the better plants and the research that you are doing about millet and and yeah. the possibilities. Uh, it's very nice and it's also expandable to other species yeah. like Kenopodium or... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true that Kenopodium is definitely something that, that, that is worth looking into. I, I mean, like, so, you, you know, one of the things that going forward on the future of the plateau that I'm very worried about is just that, you know, when you think about Tibetan or, I mean, and even for the non-Tibetan speakers, right, there's a, there's a, it's an area of huge linguistic diversity, the Eastern Tibetan Plateau, you have Tibetan speakers and then Gelrongic speakers and Changik speakers and most people call them Tibetan but they're actually you know quite distinct ethnic groups but regardless like you know when you look at their economic systems all of their economic systems are sort of delicately adapted to this world that has been the world that we've known for the past 4,000 years in terms of temperature and we're just we are just barreling outside of those conditions so fast I, I mean I saw a farmer a Han Chinese farmer in one of these river valleys growing rice and I got out of the car and I was like, what is going on? I cannot believe somebody's growing rice here. So I like, you know, I ran around, found the farmer. It turns out it was like a Han Chinese guy, you know, from lower altitude who moved there. And he's like, well, it felt warm. So I tried it and it works. And it's like, you know, 50 years ago, that would not have worked um, in this area of the plateau. And, and um, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's incredibly worrying because you wonder what is this going to do to animal forage grass? What is this going to do to, you know, people who are cultivating wheat and barley as staples? And, and there's so much culture that is tied to that, that I think is really, you know, potentially risking being lost. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, because your work yeah. reminds me of the work of Laurent Pré, but she's working more in, a, in Brazil, in the forest, in the Amazonian forest. But yeah. you were saying uh, exactly the same thing that you were pointing out, like it's more important to to save the people 
uh, which yeah. are uh, you know, like generating the ecosystem than the plants, actually, yeah. because this is a change that creates the biodiversity between the crop, between the seeds and yeah. the, the, the animals. And it's uh, and something which is uh, quite endangered today in many parts of the world. And Tibet is a yeah. striking example, actually. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's definitely extremely worrying. So yeah. you know that's the, the the global warming is terrifying on this front, and particularly there because um, they're at the at the for, for, forefront of it. <laughs> and, yeah. So um, from my end, I think everybody is uh, yeah tired, or maybe I'm yeah yeah I'm sure you guys are. It's late there, <laughs> yeah. and you are starting your day, Jade. Yeah. Thank you very much for being yeah. with us today. Thank you very um, much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's just really nice chatting with you all. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Um, yeah. yeah, we stayed in touch. Thank yeah, you. please do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let, let me know. I hope someday you can come to visit San Diego. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Have a lovely day. Bye. 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 Bye.